We as an industry can approach zero avoidable damages. It's possible. Part of it is process driven, part of it is relationship driven, part of it is technology. How is damage prevention going to look 20 years from now? No one can prevent damages on their own. In every step of the design, installation, protection, and maintenance of underground utilities, there are people working diligently and innovatively to reduce damages. All these people deserve and need to have their stories told, which is what we do here at Planet Underground TV. In this show, we'll look at a process that many utility contractors are starting to use to reduce damages, post-811 locating. I mean, it's a good deal, I think. I think every crew should have one. You know, it, it helps. You know, I'm a firm believer in locating. We'll also look at collecting utility location data whenever possible. From planning phase, design phase, permitting phase, one call phase to construction phase, we have to be collecting data at all those points. Our final segment brings you up close and personal with a successful horizontal directional drill crew where trusting each other is an everyday part of the job. If you don't come in with the right state of mind while we're working near dangerous power and gas services, some things are unforgivable. <laughs> Planet Underground TV is only made possible with the support of our sponsors. C-Scan, Intren, and HBK Engineering. We are profoundly thankful for the support of these forward-looking companies that believe in leadership through action. Not many contractors perform post-811 locating. But as you'll see in our first story, these crews believe much of their success is because they verify the integrity of the 811 mark. With every job, locating is not an exact science. There are challenges with locates. We have our own locators to hook up. Everyone on my crew knows how to hook up and we come together uh, to figure out problem areas and most of the time we can figure it out. Everyone on our crew is trained to use the locator. Everybody is capable of uh, you know, doing a sweep on a shot and uh, picking up something that's off. Uh, also what we do is, uh, before the guys actually dig up the locates, is they grab the locator and they'll actually, not, this is not just power, we'll do uh, say a gas service, we'll hook up to the gas meter and we'll run out that gas service and see if his marks are accurate before we even start digging. That way, a couple things, number one, we can catch a mistake on his part, and it also saves us time where we're not digging down you know, four or five feet and not finding anything and then having to call a locator back out or just keep digging to try and find something. Today the challenge that we ran into are uh, some of these locates have been off a couple feet and we have found utilities in the ground that aren't marked that have been deemed old utilities by the locators that came out here and double checked it for us. So what we got here is we had uh, the down feed pole coming down here. This is the uh, feed for the school behind us here. Uh, <clears throat> What our guys did is we dug up this locate. This is where we were going to uh, cross this, uh, this uh, line here. And uh, once we dug it up, we uh, could see that it's not running uh, the way it is marked. So what we did is we grabbed our locator and we followed it out and actually uh, picked it up. As you can see these pink dots right here, this is where it's actually running. And uh, the thing is actually marked in the sidewalk. We're gonna get our uh, uh, vac truck, get him backed up here, and we're gonna have to spot this thing in three more locations to verify its uh, exact location to make sure that we don't have any issues. We locate every day of the week. We double check, because it's like I said, even if it's not our fault, it still slows us down. It doesn't take us long to locate. Every guy on the crew is proficient in locating, and uh, so we just do. And it makes our job easier, because now, you know, when they just got paint on the ground, we don't have depth. So when we clip on, now we know, oh, hey, this, this is going to be shallow. Be careful. You know what I mean? You know, that line's going to be shallow or, you know, it's going to be deep. So you can open it up quite a bit. A lot of this cable has been in the ground since uh, the early 70s, late 60s. There's a lot of uh, abandoned stuff that's in the ground. So 
making sure what we're digging up is the actual good line and not something that's abandoned. We use our electronics as far as our locating equipment to re-hook up once we find what we're looking for or what's marked. Just verify that that's the cable that's marked. A lot of times if you're hand digging, it's kind of silly, I think, not to put your locator on it the first time. Make sure that they ain't off three, four, or five feet. You know, every time I've ever done a bore or come across utility, and them guys will hand dig for 10 minutes or so, I'll usually say, let me go get the locator. You know, and it, it does help. I don't, and I've found very few utility companies ever get onto us about opening up a pad or, you know, they're more than happy to, for us to take that extra chance to find it. You know, in these subdivisions, you'll have drainage, and they'll never mark that. They say, you know, that's our responsibility to find it. We was back there digging, and we noticed there's a uh, four sewer main back there that nobody even knew about. And we actually set a utility box, power box, on top of it. I mean, you know, finally, we have walked that long enough. We found a tracer wire. It actually had a tracer wire with it, so we, we put our locator on it, and we had to actually get with our engineer and kick our stuff over because it they, they staked it right on top of it. We would have dug it right up. We locate for entron. Each locator locates up to four to five crews. Private utilities also. You do run into issues sometimes. Sometimes they'll mismark utilities and it's throwing us off because we were picking up something and then we have the crew dig it up and sure enough the contractor was off. A lot of people think just hooking up you could just run it and it's easy, but there's a lot of troubleshoots and a lot of things you gotta think about. If we get any bleed off on a locate, we always hook up the TV, phone, sometimes gas, whatever, just to verify that that's the tone we're picking up. Sometimes the crews call us to check some of the locates and we, we go out there and check them. If we can't double check on the marks, whether it be phone, gas, water, uh, cable TV, we would not be as successful as what we are. We have to have that equipment. We teach that as they come in as groundmen, that this is a useful tool. It's just as important as your shovels that you're using to, to expose the utility. Without having that piece of equipment, it's just like missing a piece of a puzzle. Nobody wants the damage. The utility company, the locating company, Nobody wants to get hurt, nobody wants to incur any of those fees. I think you'd be going to be putting paint down for a long time, um, but the paint is going to be part of the process of building the mapping infrastructure so you know where all this stuff is. And y y even if you've located an area once before, you want to go out, and if you got another ticket to a different utility, you want to go out and locate it again, and you want to see if the stuff they located the second time lines up with the stuff they did the first time, and then you start getting some really deep understanding about what the quality integrity of information is. Data is getting cheaper, and part of the technology change that just happened in this industry is we need to make mapping a lot less expensive. I sort of have this vision that a contract locator ought to go out in the field with a rig and be able to do what it looks mostly like a conventional locate today and come back and download a map. Can you add 20% to the cost of a one call locator and come back with some valuable information and in terms of a map, are you gonna, is it going to have to be 200%? And that's, that's going to be a key question that's going to sort of set how this, how this rolls forward, I suspect. In, in the world of maps, uh, Google owns their maps and Microsoft owns Bing and uh, who controls the data? Um, what does that look like? And uh, I don't have an answer to that question. Our next story delves into the process of creating a shared repository of utility location information that can lower construction project costs while enhancing excavation safety. My vision of what would happen 20 years from now if, if, if things were done the right way would be that the, the utilities would be represented in a single comprehensive digital and three-dimensional uh, print that everybody could access from their own offices, their own workplaces, that the locators would have available in the field. Right now, what we don't have is a system that updates itself. In, in other words, each utility is responsible for doing their own updates. Um, and the, the timing and the pace of those updates is, is inconsistent. They may pay to have a design done for a given uh, installation at some intersection. Two years later, another utility comes into the same intersection and they pay for that design again. One of the things that takes the longest time in rolling out a utility improvement is the time it takes to gather the information. 
So if I had a database available to me that I could go look at on a day's notice and see that utility background that I was going to design my improvements on, I just shaved 30 to 45 days off of my deployment time. When you look at a city of Chicago, for an example, the amount of utilities and data that we started to collect, it became overwhelming very quickly. Systems would crash, they were slow. We had good design drawings, but in order to make an overall impact of like this central database idea, we were a ways to go on this. So we sought out on this path of taking what was good archives or, or old atlases, if you could find them, and bringing them to it and trying to establish those atlases and correlate them to survey data that we could take. So at that point we thought we were onto something and that from there, if we could correlate more atlases to actual field survey data in the design phase, we would be down a path in which we could really create uh, a great damage prevention tool. We started to move from there and starting to collecting from there when we were out on construction sites doing construction observation and we had surveyors on site, we would be able to collect data. We have a lot of data starting to compile and come in. We start really taxing those new computer systems. One of the big aspects of the map of the future is three-dimensional. What is the biggest challenge of creating that three-dimensional map? And it is the Z data. Z is usually not represented as the utilities never really had a reason to do it unless it was a gravity-based sewer system. So I think 20 years from now we're going to be able to, if we, if we do a better job today in collecting data from all phases of a utility construction life cycle, um, the systems will be able to allow us to access it quickly, store it, protect the confidentiality for each utility owner of what they want to protect, and then we're going to be on to something. In most cases, a utility that goes out and installs new improvements on their system is going to capture records about their own installation. But the opportunities that the Open Trent provides um, for capturing information about the other utilities around it are, are, are really good. Where I see 20 years from now, the exciting part, what we learned, we need to be able to attach more data than X, Y, and Z data. What happens if we had information in the planning phase that included procurement information or long lead item information on that utility that would need to be relocated or protected? Special procedures that would be needed to take during the construction phase of how to support that specific utility. Now we're on to something to where that contractors today run in and they, they get a utility that they have to support, relocate, or do something. And what seemed to be an easy task in the planning phase is absolutely, it's, 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 it's a very, very difficult and dangerous uh, application in the construction phase. So one of the things that we've always you know, talked about and, and looked at as a, as a way to improve the way we do work in the city is to build that centralized map, that, that framework for hanging that information on and to give incentive for those, those excavators and for the engineers working around it to pick up that information. When we go into an intersection and we do a design for excavation, we want our information to be as accurate as possible. It affects the quality of our job, it affects the safety of the installation and the efficiency of the installation. So if we can create a system where we're going to go in and pick up information about the other utilities that are exposed during that, we're actually making our job easier in the future. I mean, this is with all due respect to, to large municipalities, large utilities. I mean, they, they have, these are big operations in which they have a lot of things that they have to do to be successful, a lot of moving parts. But one of the hurdles for us would be we would like to see them to be able to adjust the way in which that they procure that, this, this work. Um, things that we typically, as a designer, would like to be able to bring into the design phase much earlier. What about bringing locating more into the design phase? What about making it rather than within 48 hours of a construction project? If we can bring that into the design phase and starting to put paint on the ground and locating this information, maybe the future is not paint on the ground, it's just being able to collect data real time and be able to store that. Now you're able to go into and be able to have construction cost savings because the contractor bidding on the work is going to have so much data and information of what they're about to embark on. And then for us, it would be to clear the hurdle of getting them to be able to afford and to be able to, to collect that data on surrounding information. So it's, it's complex, but uh, we have to keep driving for efficiencies. And when we build efficiencies, use that area of savings to be able to apply it for future generations via data collection. This idea of mapping only works if all of the players are playing together as a team. It begins with the installation and getting the proper record keeping, 
about where the facilities are placed, who's going to store that data, whether it's a municipality or someone else, and then once that data is, is stored and shared, who's going to be able to use it to their benefit? Mapping, I think, is going to be fundamental to the future of this industry. It seems like this is an information problem. Everybody's not looking at the same information. The information is fragmented, but it's, it's an information problem. And, it's going to be, and, and information is about technology. I mean, it's sort of the Google pipes. One of the big problems here is there's an assumption that we just have to take the information that we don't have and accurately put it on the maps. It seems to me we're sending a lot of people out in the field to do a lot of locating. And the thing that has to change is you have to capture that information. The maps are not accurate. Um, a lot of them came from paper, and it's just, they're not accurate in the context of current GPS technology. The, the game here is we've got to get out and collect and aggregate this information, and it's, this, it's the adding the information over and over again. If you're going out and doing design locates, uh, in front of my house, they've relocated the thing six times in the last six months, the entire street. It's been potholed three times by two different companies to put in th um, two different sets of fibers. None of this information is being saved. It's not being aggregated. If you looked across the city and you asked how many, how many potholes were done a year, then, then it's in the thousands. And you know, how much of that information is kept stored and available to anybody, it's probably less than 100. OK, Jim, push me at, uh, hit that plus out. Push me down at 4 o'clock, foot and a half at 4, and spin it out. The importance of picking up record information when you directionally bore uh, the facilities in. You have the best read and the best signal at the head of that directional bore that you'll ever have. So what we want to have is we want to have a read off that directional boring head every time that we put another rod into the ground. To lose that information is the, in my opinion, the greatest disadvantage to damage prevention that we could have. All right, so right now Mike wants me to spin out. So as you're spinning, you look at your top left gauge, and that'll indicate how much torque it has, to, how much torque is going through to spin it out. So right now, the ground being a little rocky, you can see it's higher. But as you start to push, you can see that climbing. And what I try to do is give me a target and just aim for that target. Keep it level, just try to keep it simple, you know. If I want him to go right, I tell him three o'clock. If I want him to go six, I down, I tell him six. If I want him to go left, I want him to go nine. Right now, Mike wants me to push nine o'clock. The left, the left stick rotates the rod. When you pull back, it moves it in a clockwise position. Pushing forward is counterclockwise. As I start to push, this won't move because I'm not spinning, but you'll see the pressure climb here. I said, just keep eye on your temperature. Because when you're spinning, just spin it a little faster toward me. When you start getting up into this range, is when you generally want to spin and do a quick rotation to relieve some of that tension. All right, Jim, uh, spin me out. Uh, give me another uh, little foot and a half or three and spin it to the five foot mark. So right now I need him to come right a little more, so I'm getting a foot and a half or three and spin it five feet and then I can check it. It's usually us all you really want to give it. It's really about a foot and a half each rod. If you give it too much, by the time they catch up with it, it'll be taken off, you know? We have one cable laid out here. It's going, we got the tail all the way, waiting for Mike to get there with the drill head. That is uh, going to be from Charlie 6 transformer, which is right there behind the fence, going to the drill, which is uh, Delta 2. So we're just waiting for the drill head to get here to hook up our swivel and uh, tie them both on and pull them back. And another big part is setting your drill straight. It's so key. 
to aim your drill where you got to go. That way you won't have to do any turning. You know, you, you know, you got to have it straight. We had a couple services we crossed down there. They were uh, about five feet apart, only two feet deep. We crossed both of those, and uh, just our our hand dig trench here. Uh, basically, we had a pretty easy shot. Once you got it straight and level, you just really kind of spin them out, you know. All right, spin the rest out, Jim. All right, Jim, I want to bring it up a little bit. Get me up to a positive five, plus five. And with this locator, you know, you place it down where you want the rod to come to. Okay, and I usually just walk up like five feet, and that's where I want the rod to come to. I want, I want it to come to me. I want to control, control the head, you know? So, like I said, you set the box, I'm, I'm headed for that hole right there. And I want to stay outside the tolerance zone. So I got a straight path to go there. All right, we're headed straight for the hole. You got about 50 more feet. I got going on right now. I'm just waiting for the tool head to poke in here. Mike's to drill it in. Just so I can get that swivel around. I'm gonna make sure all the clevises are tight. Put some tension on these cables. And then we're good to start dead pulling it. Watch out for that. He's gonna dead pull for the first pull, meaning he won't spin or anything like that. Once I get past the, about halfway point of this sock, I'll tell him that he can spin and take it away. Now nah, it's about over halfway. He can go ahead and take it away any way he likes. Now the main key factor of while he's pulling back is just making sure the cable's laid out smooth and no kinks or anything like that come through it. Everybody out here really always gives 110% it seems like, and never a dull day as long as we all got the right attitude. I work with a really good team. I mean, we're usually all on the same page and uh, you know everybody gets along. Hold on, Jim, let me change this battery. Put the battery on the charger for the chief. You got another one? Yeah, I got one. We all uh, try to plan on uh, you know the, how the day's gonna go. It's just, you know, it's fun to be a part of this team. Teamwork, so important for a utility construction crew, but also for others in damage prevention. Our interview segment looks back on the early days of introducing technology to a team of locators serving a metropolitan area. I located with just split box devices and basically you got a call from the dispatcher and said, I got to locate at this address with this contractor and that's all you got. So you kind of knew what people were doing and just, you know, it, it's a far cry from where you're at today. But the only thing that was underground, and I always say it was really easy locating because at that point, gas was about three to four feet underground and water was 10 feet underground and everything else was overhead. Believe me, when we started doing this, even though everything else was electronic, all the maps were either on paper or they were what the telephone companies had the little fish readers, microfiche readers, and to look in one of those and try to read a map and see what was in the ground was not an easy scenario. The dispatchers would sit there all day long, one of the people on the locating desk would sort those tickets into individual inner office envelopes, and at four o'clock somebody came and picked them up, a courier, and hauled them out to the offices, and then at midnight the audit report came in, but there was no way to verify anything because we had already sent all the tickets out to the field and you were not going to verify 1,200 tickets. So we did that for a while. The youngest locator I had at that point that started using computers in the field was 20 years seniority. The oldest had 40 years seniority. Most of them threatened to quit. <laughs> they, they said it was just a time clock. And I said, you know what, it may be, but I said, if I, if I use the data and don't abuse the data, and you guys do what you're supposed to do, we don't have to go to contract locating. And most of them bought into it and did a good job. The last person that I put on a computer was a guy that had 40 years. Two weeks after he said it, he said, I was gonna 
retire or quit the day you gave me that? He says, this is the neatest thing I've ever done. But it was 19, you're talking 1990, this is when, I mean, laptops, people didn't have them out in the field, didn't do whatever. So, and I went home many nights and, and my wife was in charge, she was a vice president of a bank that did a lot of technology. I said, if I ever volunteer to be in charge of a technology project, shoot me. Planet Underground TV supports a bright future where data collection, information sharing, and technological improvements attract the best and the brightest in the utility business. I think the technology is available to solve this problem. I think the solution will fall in place within the next 10 years. By 2020, um, there's a presumption that your smartphone may be able to see 100 satellite birds in the sky at the same time with Galileo going up and the Chinese compass going up and all these redundant satellites plus improvements in GPS technology. Cell phones by way sooner than 40 years are going to be sort of one meter devices and that's probably going to get to a half meter device. Planet Underground TV once more thanks C-Scan, Intrend, and HBK Engineering for making this series possible. A thousand different very good variations are made of different utility maps around the city as opposed to one very good one that's improved every time someone touches it. Instead of us spending our time recreating the drawing of the world, we're going out and we're improving its value.